The year 1996 saw the release of the game Quake, one of the greatest FPS games ever to be released. Quake was mostly known for its fast-paced, movement-based mechanics, and its vertical and complex map design. This became the standard for what would become the arena FPS genre. Things would change when another genre-defining game, Counter-Strike, would release in 2000. Slower-paced, team-based gameplay featuring an economy and loadouts, this game was one of the best tactical shooters of its time. As time went on, tactical shooters continued to grow and are, as of now, some of the most popular shooters. Meanwhile, arena shooters, and more specifically Quake, began to dwindle and become far more obscure. Quake and other arena FPS games became the fighting games of the FPS genre. But why? Why did this happen meanwhile tactical shooters saw great success? Why did the arena FPS genre die, and what impact did it leave on future game titles? Today I want to take a look at the fall of the once popular Quake franchise and the genre it pioneered. The first reason I believe this downfall came about is, well, simply put, Arena FPS games are really hard! Watch this, Lise. You can actually pinpoint the second when his heart rips in half. And... now! Now what exactly makes them hard? Well, for starters, they tend to be more aim-centric. Quake is a great example of this. Quake has lots of different weapons, but for the sake of simplicity, we're just going to go over the main three. These are the Rocket Launcher, Lightning Gun, and the Rail Gun, which have their own iterations in other Arena FPS games as well. These weapons all encompass the different types of aiming, from predicting, tracking, and flicking. Even slight differences in elevation can dictate which weapon is more optimal to use in a particular situation. This makes your weapon choice an important factor in deciding gunfights. Overwatch is another example of a more aim-centric arena FPS game. Although this game barely counts as an arena FPS game. Targets are constantly moving around in Overwatch and vary in size and speed. Overwatch features all three of the staple old-school arena FPS weapons with Farah's Rocket Launcher, Widow Sniper, along with other hitscan characters, and several characters who have weapons that require excellent tracking from Tracer to Zarya. Now, aim is something present in every FPS game, and is fairly difficult across most of them. But what about more specific things to arena FPS shooters? There's also resource management, one of the more strategic elements of arena FPS games, and one of the most important as well. We will use Quake for our example here. A typical Quake map features weapons, health pickups, and armor, which usually ranges from about 2 to 3 per map, and power-ups such as the quad damage. For now, we'll just be discussing armor as well as the mega health. In Quake, armor responds every 25 seconds. This allows players to do what is called cycling, where they go from one armor to the next up until they end up back at the first armor they grabbed, creating a loop where players will engage each other at each armor position trying to keep control of the map's resources. To add on to this, there's also Mega Health, which has different iterations in how it spawns depending on the game, with Quake 1 having a 90 second respawn time, and then Quake Live having a 35 second respawn time, but usually it's a lot harder to cycle than the rest of the items on the map. This is just for major items though. Weapons and smaller health items are also an important resource to keep track of. If you aren't playing 1v1, then power-ups are also present, adding another important resource to keep track of. Power-ups can change the outcome of a match drastically, giving the player awesome power of either destruction, <laughs> invincibility, or invisibility. invisibility, although invisibility honestly isn't that good. As you can imagine, this is very hard to keep track of and makes the game extremely fast-paced and tense. Quake is a more extreme example of this on-the-map resource item management as it's present in tons of other arena FPS games as well. Both Overwatch and TF2 feature health packs, which although are nowhere near as important to keep track of as they are in Quake, can decide the outcome of some fights. This form of on-the-map resource management contrasts with a lot of tactical shooters where resources are typically managed via an economy or limited use equipment. On the map resource management also affects player positioning heavily by rewarding good positioning to punish or steal items. Positioning leads us to our next skill issue present in arena FPS games, movement. 
Movement is often cited as the main reason for the decline in the arena FPS genre. Like how wave dashing is a unique tool in melee that allows for deep player expression, bunny hopping and rocket jumping are mechanical tools that also allow for deep player skill expression. Bunny hopping is basically where a player just jumps up and down consecutively, but it's a lot more deep than that. It has different variations such as classic ADA bunny hopping from Quake 1 and Source, strafe jumps from Quake 3 and Quake Live, and crouch hops from Titanfall and Apex Legends. Often bunny hopping came at the cost of control of movement, making it not optimal to be bunny hopping during combat, but was really great for getting around swiftly. Rock jumping is another staple arena FPS movement technique, where players fire an explosive at their feet, sending them into the air, giving them great vertical height. Rocket jumping once again originated from Quake, but is also present in loads of other games, such as TF2, Overwatch, Watch, Ultra Kill, Valorant, and even Battlefield, albeit a very unique way. <laughs> Combining these two techniques in Quake leads to the most insane movement ever devised in any video game, allowing for cross map traversal in seconds. As you probably realize, this leads to crazy good positioning as well. Better movement leads to better positioning, better positioning leads to better resource management, better resource management gives you a better chance at winning aim duels, and winning aim duels will win you matches. This creates large skill gaps between players where matches can feel totally one-sided, as these techniques are not easy to perform and take large amounts of practice. Yes! Hell yeah! Hey, come on, baby! Come on! Yes! Come on! This obviously leads to player frustration that would lead some to mistake this kind of movement as a mechanical barrier more than a mechanical tool. What is a mechanical barrier? Let's go back to my example of melee. In melee, there's another mechanic in the game called L cancelling. In melee, when an attack is performed in the air and its attack animation isn't finished before the player hits the ground, the player will be in landing lag. These are a couple frames where the player is unable to do anything and is left defenseless. But, if the player presses a shield button before landing, the landing lag is shortened by a significant amount. This is an L-cancel. Now you may be asking, why not just make all attacks have shorter landing lag without L-canceling? That would be a good question, I have no clue. There are trade-offs to using wave dashing, meanwhile with L-canceling you're strictly putting yourself at a disadvantage. It is nothing more than an arbitrary barrier, or a mechanical barrier, if you will. Like, would there ever be a situation where you intentionally didn't L-cancel? No! 99.9% .9 of the time, no. So why is it mechanic? I could honestly talk about this L-canceling thing for a while, so I'm gonna, I'm gonna stop here and get back to the main point of the video. There's a lack of unique player choice that comes with these arbitrary barriers. Meanwhile, mechanical tools create multiple options for players to choose from. This, of course, doesn't mean that mechanical tools should be crazy difficult either, as the more accessible they are, the more people can enjoy these parts of the game. Quake even addresses this in later installments by introducing Auto Hop, where you don't have to time your jumps and can instead just hold down the jump key. It made B hopping more accessible without taking away any of its depth or utility, although this is a minor change. With Quake and Arena FPS games, they're still overall very mechanically difficult. Now that I have defined both a mechanical tool and barrier, we can talk about the second reason Arena FPS games died. Their developers tried to kill them. Now, I'll admit this is a very hyperbolic statement. Of course, the developers of these gays... Gays? <laughs> okay! Okay! Of course, the developers of these games didn't want them to fail. However, there is a trend you can see in games featuring more complicated tech, where developers actively try to remove it from their games, despite it being fun and generally nobody complaining about it. It started back in Quake 1, where when the devs saw bunny hopping, they immediately tried to eradicate it from their next installment, Quake 2. Their attempt was in vain, however as this gave birth to strafe jumping, which is essentially a more restrictive and faster bunny hop. Half-Life 2 Deathmatch is another example where it used to have literally some of the most insane movement tech ever devised in a video game. You, you see this Deathmatch footage on screen? This is insane. This stuff's nuts. But after the Orange Box update, it all vanished. Disappear. Gone. Not non-existent. This one's really unfortunate because this game, like, now is just garbage. You load up the servers and they're just like empty and there none of them have anything to do with actual deathmatch dude it's why is pistol a good weapon i can't hit him from over here i can't hit him from over here why is the pistol the best weapon somebody tell me why somebody tell me who designed this and thought yeah we make the pistol now.
Yeah, for some reason most servers have gravity set to low, and headshots are one-hit kills, so the pistol automatically becomes the best weapon in the game. And as you can imagine, it's pretty lame, but you, you can still manage to hit some clips here and there. But I highly suggest not playing this. Just don't. A more modern example of this would be Overwatch's removal of the Genji boost, which wasn't even that game-changing from what I can tell, but despite that, just because it was technically a bug, they got rid of it. Another big L from Blizzard, along with everything else. One thing I think devs are absolutely terrified are skill gaps, or a significant difference in skill between players. More specifically, I think they're afraid of mechanical ones, as these are much more difficult to deal with than strategic ones. Strategic skill gaps would be situations such as counterpicking Genji into Zarya and Overwatch, or pushing an enemy who has a positional and weapon advantage on you. Strategic skill gaps boil down to players making poor choices or lacking game knowledge. Mechanical ones, on the other hand, are much harder to overcome as a player. These encompass things such as movement, combos, or aim. Learning tech can take lots of time, and some might say it's not worth it. Some will pour hours into their mechanics and only improve marginally. There we go. So when developers see this happening, their first instinct is to get rid of the problem or make it easier to approach, which is fine for the most part. Garbage ass screw. The issue arises when the solution is watering down interesting game mechanics for the sake of the less mechanically skilled, or actively reducing the skill ceiling. This does fix the problem, but also prevents top-level play from pushing the limits of what's possible in the game. Take the auto-hop example I gave earlier. Imagine if instead of implementing auto-hop, they replaced it with sprinting and jumping no longer gave the player speed increases of any kind. This would solve the problem of b-hopping being a mechanical issue, by replacing it with something that technically does its same job of moving around the map, but with more efficiency and less effort. But that's not all that b-hopping did. B-hopping could be chained with rockets to increase movement speed beyond the b-hop cap, could be used to perform trick jumps, could be used to skillfully dodge rockets and mix up your opponent, and overall has more depth than just sprinting. Versus the implementation of auto-hop makes all that cool stuff I just talked about easier, and didn't take away from any of that cool stuff either. It didn't water it down or lower its depth in any way. And while we're on the topic of mechanical skills, I think one of the largest contributing factors to the death of the arena FPS genre was the coming of the console age. The tech in these games was already pretty difficult to perform, but bunny hopping and doing rocket jumps on console all while trying to aim duel your opponent? Yeah, that's not easy, I'll tell you that much. The only games that could be considered arena FPS games back in the day that were okay to play on console were Halo, GoldenEye, and Time Splitters 2. And even then, these were more watered down compared to their PC counterparts and could barely qualify as arena shooters. Nowadays, there are certainly better options on console, such as Splitgate, Fortnite. Oh I feel like Spider Man God. with this shit. Spider Man. Spider Man. <laughs> Doom 2016 and Eternal, Overwatch, and even some of the OGs, such as Quake Remastered. But even with that, these games still play far better on PC, and because of that, people on console often opt to play other games instead. I mean, why play these complex and difficult arena FPS games when you can just load up a game of COD and turn off your brain? More hardcore arena FPS games, on the other hand, such as Quake or Team Fortress, are strictly worse on console and far more realized on PC. Or are they? In a video made by YouTuber SolarLight, he explored the viability of using a controller on TF2, which actually worked quite well, although with some caveats. For one, playing with traditional controls where the right stick is used for looking around doesn't work well. Can't really perform flicks, movement tech is far more difficult, and without aim assist, it is far harder to aim. But using flick stick plus gyro allows you to play at the same level a mouse and keyboard player would, if not better. Flick stick, as the name suggests, allows you to snap to any horizontal direction you choose, and Gyro allows you to precisely aim and track enemies at the same level a mouse would. Solarlight did his video specifically on TF2, but I checked and it's very possible to perform quick movement tech using this as well. I won't spoil any more of Solarlight's video, and I highly suggest you check it out. So this is the solution, right? Well, not exactly. For one, developers have to create support for this control style, which is kind of niche at the moment. Hello, Mr. Game Dev, sir. I'd like to request that you add gyro and flick stick support to your game. Second, this requires controller players to learn a new and seemingly unconventional control scheme. Another solution is aim assist, but that one is very contentious. How do I lose that? 
Because he's on uh, controller! That's why! But there is one solution that trumps them all. Native mouse and keyboard support. This one is extremely obvious, and I don't know why more consoles and games allow for this, because it would end this debate so fast. Instead of worrying about having to buy a nice PC to play at top level, you can instead just buy a console and a mouse and keyboard and do the same thing for cheaper. And with crossplay becoming more standard, it doesn't really matter if one plays against keyboard and mouse players because they're already playing against those on PCs anyway. And if for some reason you didn't want to play with others on opposing control schemes, then there are settings that compare you with other players on your same controls. Lastly, I want to make a micro point regarding player choice. This one mainly applies to Quake, but can apply to other games as well. One of the biggest problems with the Quake formula from a gameplay standpoint is its map design in tandem with how the game's loadouts work. This is because you find all of your gear on the map as opposed to picking it before a match starts like a loadout in Call of Duty. Now, I love this aspect of the game as it creates interesting engagements, gives the game a more strategic aspect, gives it more depth, and overall adds a very unique flow to the game that you really can't find in other FPS titles. However, there is a glaring flaw with this, and that is how it removes player choice from the game, or rather punishes it, especially at a higher level of play. That is because it creates a quote, perfect way to play a map. There will come a point where players often repeat actions over and over again based upon what map they play, which can get boring. So instead of playing your opponent, you're essentially playing the map. Take for instance Catalyst, a map from Reflex Arena. When you spawn here in a duel or 1v1, you essentially have three options. Either A, grab the red armor, then the rocket over here. B, walk up the steps, go through the telly, grab the weapons up top, and then the yellow armor. Or C, go through the telly behind you and try to interrupt your opponent grabbing their items. Now, when you hear this, you think, oh wow, I have tons of unique and varied options and responses to my opponent. But this isn't actually true. <sighs> you liar. This is similar to fighting games, as fighting games give you multiple options to respond to an opponent's options, but there's glaring differences between the two. Take a look at this knockdown situation here. I have a multitude of options here which have different pros and cons that create a sort of rock paper scissors situation. Quake on the other hand creates the same thing but rock beats both paper and scissors. The correct answer here is B as it gives you the most resources as well as routes to react to your opponent's choices. You can also still grab the red armor from here as well so that's a huge plus. Option A isn't terrible, but puts you in potential combat with your opponent when they have more stacks. Option C basically does the same thing as option A, but now you only have two of the worst weapons in the game, that being the shotgun and the grenade launcher. If we compare this even to a game like COD, we see something entirely different, where maps are something to be tackled based upon player preference as opposed to where the map imposes how a player should play. This is because in COD, you can pick your loadout. If you pick a sniper, you would want to watch these longer lines of sight in the middle of this map, versus if you pick something such as like an SMG, you would probably take this right route and try and go for flanks, but this is only an example of what you can do, and there's tons more things you can do, even at a higher level of play. <clears throat> Just a quick disclaimer, because I know people are going to comment this, in no way, shape, or form, am I implying that Call of Duty, as a competitive game, has more depth than Quake. It obviously doesn't. Call of Duty takes monkey dung for brains and is by far the most brain-dead shooter on the market. Just making a small point about player choice and map design, which admittedly Call of Duty kind of nails just a tad bit better in the player choice department. That is it. That's all I'm saying. <laughs> now, this is not to say that Quake lacks this aspect of player choice uh, in particular to the map design and whatnot, because it's definitely there. However, due to Quake's design philosophy, your options tend to be very map dependent compared to other games. There's a reason I didn't mention a lot of the other weapons in Quake at the beginning of the video, and that's because a lot of them suck outside of very niche situations. And the sort of meta of the game, if you will, is you have the rocket launcher, rail gun, and light gun is your main go-to weapons you will use for nearly all of your engagements and if you don't have them you would resort to the other weapons as a sort of last ditch effort. This also means there are only three weapons in the game you can really develop a playstyle around and so because of that there's 
a limited amount of player expression involved when it comes to engagements. Quake Champions has been the only game to really address this by adding champions with different abilities, which can add more variety to how players move through the map and engage with each other, as well as having a little bit better weapon balance. But I wouldn't really say that's enough. One game that did a better job of working with Quake's framework was TF2 which added a lot more player expression to the game by its loadout system, where there are variants to weapons. A system like this in Quake would be amazing, where players would try to collect different weapons based upon what they picked for their loadouts beforehand. So let's say you had equipped a variant of the plasma gun that turned it into a minigun or something, removing the utility it had for more damage or something, right? Players could then change the routing according to what weapons are strongest in their loadouts or how they want to play. You could even do something like this with perks too, and you know, kind of mash the two concepts together of on the map weapon usage and loadouts. This would also do away with Quake's sort of inherent balance hierarchy where the main three weapons sit at the top as the very best and the other weapons are just lesser and more situational. But this is getting into hypothetical territory and we will likely never see anything like this happen ever, which is a real shame. So to conclude, why did arena FPS games such as Quake die. I think it's due to three main things. One, they are difficult. Two, their developers either didn't address these difficulty issues, like in the case of Quake, or overdid it and hurt their games, like in the case of Overwatch. And three, they can lack player choice, although this is a minor point. What's weird is that these issues could be solved, but the player base is almost against it. There is a reason I compared these games to fighting games at the beginning of the video, and that is because they both face similar issues when it comes to perceived difficulty and accessibility. The fighting game community had a different approach, where they wanted more from their developers, which made games like Street Fighter VI, which made fighting games more accessible and fun for everyone, without harming their depth or competitive scenes. The Quake community, on the other hand, justifies the game's lack of accessibility and learning resources, saying, Oh man, the, the modern gamer, man, is such a pussy, man. Modern gamers these days, man, they just can't handle the, the, uh, the difficulty of these arena FPS games because they're such wussies, they want instant gratification. Which just isn't true <laughs> at all. People just want to have fun and enjoy the games they're playing. I don't think anybody enjoys getting absolutely noob stomped by some 60 year old dude who's been playing Quake since 1996. It's not fun, and there's no learning that goes on there either. So, basically... Quake should become Street Fighter 6. Thank you, everybody. <laughs> no, but for real, I love these games. But it makes me sad to see the amount of potential they have that is just going to waste and kind of rotting away because the genre is just not around anymore. It makes me really sad because they're really fun. I honestly think they could be some of the greatest competitive games of all time. Let's say that for some reason, despite me complaining most of this video, you thought Arena FPS games looked interesting and you wanted to give them a try. I have a couple suggestions for you. Quake Champions is probably the best game I can recommend for those who are new to the genre while still wanting the full experience. It's free to play, always has some people playing TDM, and allows for the most player choice, making it a more smooth experience. If you want a more pure experience, then Quake Live is a good one. I personally play this one probably the most out of any of the arena FPS games I play, and it's pretty fun. Of course there is TF2, another free to play choice. This game can be both really competitive as well as really casual. This game is just good in general, and if you haven't played it yet, you need to. For those of you on console, there's Overwatch 2. This game honestly barely counts as an arena FPS game, as a lot of the game's more interesting mechanics are overshadowed by its huge emphasis on team play, which on a free-to-play shooter where most people would be solo queuing, it isn't exactly the best time. Although this game seems to be getting better, I think. Splitgate is another really fun free-to-play title featuring portals, which allows for insane traversal. This one is really easy to get into while also having a massive skill ceiling. Highly suggest at least trying this one. If you're on console and you specifically want to play Quake, I suggest playing good old Quake Remaster. Quake 1 definitely has its rough spots, especially in the more competitive side of things, but it gives it charm. This game also has partial mod support on console and is crossplay, which I think is sick. Definitely try this one out. Shotgun Farmers is one I mentioned earlier that is really fun. Simplifies the Quake formula while also having a fun cartoony art style and being very, very easy to pick up. And also there's like tons of little kids playing this one so you can just noob stomp every match you play. Remember when I referred to arena FPS games as the fighting games of the FPS genre? This game would be considered the anime fighter of the arena FPS genre. Reflex Arena. 
This game is pure Quake at its finest, being an all-skill, no bullshit kind of experience. I would recommend this game, but it's like 100% dead, and the only people who play it are me and a couple of really sweaty nerds. Xenotic is another one in the realm of anime fighter arena FPS games that is free to play. This one is very deathmatch focused with regenerating health and the laser controlled rocket from Half-Life 2. This one is way less hardcore as the other games mentioned on here and is mostly just fun. And that leads us to the end of today's video. I hope you guys enjoyed. Uh, sorry this one took a while. <laughs> I know I said I was going to upload more over the summer. And then I didn't. Now I got this video out. This was a big project. I spent a lot of time working on this, more than it should have. I should have probably, but now it's out. Leon Massey did a very similar video to mine on power weapons. Uh, our theses were pretty similar, so maybe go check that video out as well. Kind of annoys me that I uploaded it around the same time he did, and he beat me to the punch. But what can you do? <laughs> Cyber Grind Guide Part 2 coming soon. Uh, expect it within the coming weeks uh after this video goes up and expect more video essays like these potentially uh depending on how this one does but we'll see anyways uh you guys have a good day uh like and subscribe it helps me out and i'll see you guys on the next one bye bye <laughs>